Okay, so yesterday we learned about like terms. Um, so let's go ahead and simplify this. What's 2x plus 2x? 4x. 4x. You saw that these were like terms, so you could add them or subtract them, and that is 4x. Very good. All right, how about 25a minus 5a? What do you get? 25a minus 5a is how many a's? 20a's. Do you guys all understand how like terms work? What's an apple plus an apple? We have two apples. What's an orange plus three oranges? Four oranges. You all understand how like terms work. It's a pretty simple idea as long as you're, you're getting the idea there. Okay. All right, let's get to the actual lesson. Oh, actually, but I do want to say um, one thing. I did upload my video lesson, but it was pretty late last night from the last yesterday's um, homework, and then I'll have this uploaded tonight. So you can get on my website and watch videos if you're having any problems. So keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, so today we're right away you're going to be taking notes. So get yourself ready to take notes. Um, I know we're getting new to the whole um, Miss Christensen's classroom, but you should be ready to take notes right now. So I, I didn't really specify that yesterday, so that's my fault. But when you come in, you have to be ready to take notes. Because really, 70 minutes seems long to you guys, but that is such short time for the stuff we have to cover each day. So we just have to hit it hard. So really we have to be ready. So like, you'll make sure you have your notes ready tomorrow, ready to take notes so I can just start right now. But I understand that I wasn't clear on that, so that's that's not your fault. Um, so today is, I would title my notes 1.1.1. Now make sure you're taking good notes. You do get bonus points on tests if you've been taking really good notes. But make sure you don't take such good notes that you didn't pay attention to the lesson. I've had a student say that. Well, look at my notes, Miss Christensen, but they're so good, and I was making sure to write everything down, and so I didn't even understand anything that was going on. And I'm like, well, that defeated the purpose. So take the notes, um, but don't, I mean, you've got to make sure you pay attention to the lesson. You don't need to write down every gory detail, but just kind of take good notes. Um, you guys you guys know what the best, um, what would be best for you, So, but take good notes, so. All right, so today we'll title your notes 1.1.1, and we're going to start out talking about properties of exponents. Um, before we start talking about the property of exponents that we're going to talk about today, um, I need to go over some vocabulary here, because you're going to hear me use the word base and exponent a lot. So look right here in this area for me. Um, just focus in on that area. Um, this part, this A, the red thing, the big thing, the strong thing, is the base. So when I say base, I'm talking the big thing. And when I say exponent, I'm talking the small thing. So you're going to hear me say the word base a lot today and exponent. And if you can't distinguish the difference, you're going to be a lost soul. So base exponent, does everybody understand? Okay, exponent can also be called a power. So I call, might call it an exponent, I might call it a power. Okay, so really, I don't want you to write down um, the zero power rule in words. I just want you to write down the actual rule right there. So that's what you're going to write on your notes, just that piece, okay? Um, so I'm going to read you what the zero power rule is, the zero exponent rule, same thing. So what this rule says is that any base raised to the zero power is equal to one. So I'm going to say that again, very slowly, and I want you to look at the rule here. Look at the rule. Any base raised to the zero power is equal to one. That's just simply what the zero power rule says. Any questions on that? Now I could get into why, and I could go through and show you all the math behind it. I promise I can do it for you, but you will not really understand it right now, not quite yet. Um, so I'll explain that why that is later, but for right now you're gonna have to just trust me because it would be a waste of your time for me to go through and explain it. So do you trust me? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Okay, so let's go ahead and practice this rule a few times. Um, but before we do that, I did see a lot of people making mistakes in the last few hours, so I want to quickly show you what mistakes. Don't write any of this down. I want you just to look, actually, um, because this is the mistakes I saw last hour, so now that I'm telling you, you won't make these mistakes. Okay, so this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing people saying any base raised to the zero power must be zero. That's not true. Any base raised to the zero power <laughs> is equal to one. So people are saying any base raised to the zero power is equal to zero. Does everybody understand that that's not true? Does everybody understand that that's not true? Not true. 
All right, and then I'm also seeing people getting the gist of the idea. They're like, I get it. Any base raised to the zero power is equal to one. But what they're doing on accident is they're just changing the exponent to one. But it's not. It's not, the exponent doesn't become one. The whole thing becomes one. So does everybody see the difference between a to the first and a one? Those are very different, right? Any base raised to the um, zero power is going to be equal. All of it is going to be equal to one, not just the exponent. Does that make sense? Are you sure? Okay. And then, um, once again, people are getting the right idea, but they're making little mistakes. Um, if you saw something like this, a times zero is equal to one. Because they're saying the rule in their head, they're saying any base raised to the zero power is equal to one. But is this, in this context, is that raised to the zero power? No, that's times zero. What is anything times zero? Zero. Zero. So it's zero power. So just make sure you don't make those little errors. Okay, let's do some examples. Right here, I don't want you to write yet. I'll tell you when to start taking notes. This will be more beneficial for you to just really watch. What is 2 to the 0 power? What's 2 to the 0 power? 1. Any base to the 0 power is equal to 1. Did we just say that rule, guys? Okay. Any base raised to the 0 power is equal to 1. So then what's 25 to the 0 power? 1. Okay, good. Well, then what the heck is this huge number, 2,000 raised to the 0 power? 1. Oh, any base. Raised to the zero power is equal to one. Interesting. Well, then what's cupcakes to the zero power? One. one. So that was just a dumb example to show you that I'm not kidding, guys. Any base raised to the zero power is equal to one. Very good. Well, then what's x to the zero power? One. It's also one. Does everybody get the idea of the zero power rule? Okay. Let's do a little. This is where, oh, okay, yeah, let's practice. One through five on the worksheet. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to do those. So what answer did you get for one through five? One. Okay, let's get to a little bit juicier of examples. Um, because really with the zero power rule, we have to be really careful um, because we have to think about what exactly we're looking at. Because the rule goes, any base raised to the zero power is equal to one. But we have to be really careful in some cases. So I don't want you to answer this one out loud. Did you just hear me? Do not answer this out loud. I want you to think to yourself. Looking at my example number one here. We have 2x to the 0 power. I'm going to read it again. 2 times x to the 0 power. I'm going to ask you a question. You're not going to answer it out loud. Is the 2 also raised to the 0 power? Think in your head. I'm going to ask you again. Do not answer it out loud. Is 2 raised to the 0 power? Okay, tell your neighbor. What do they think? Yes or no and why? Ready, set, go. Is 2 raised to the 0 power? So I'm hearing a few yes, as I'm hearing a few no. Okay, group number 6. What conclusion did you come to? That'd be you guys. No. You said no. Okay, that is actually correct. So can you guys tell me why? Because x is raised to 0 power, not 2. Very good. They were, okay, I'm loving what I hear here. He just said, two is not raised to the zero power, just the x is raised to the zero power. And then he even went further, which is awesome. He said, technically, if we want to get technical, which we do, um, two is raised to the what power? What did you one. say? One. one. This is really two to the first power. What's anything raised to the first power? Itself. Itself. So really, we have 2 to the first power times x to the 0 power. Does everybody see how these are the same things? So technically, not every number is to the one power unless it's set up. Correct. Very good point. Very good point. So what's 2 to the first power? 2. 2, and then what's x to the 0 power? 1. So 2 times 1 is 2. So our final answer would have been 2. Any questions? Okay. Well, let's look at another one. 2x to the 0 power. I just read it the same. 2x to the 0 power. Now this time I'm going to ask you, is 2 raised to the 0 power? Yes. How do you know it's a yes? Because the whole thing is raised to it. It's all is 1. Okay, I want you to, you're absolutely right. 
I want to, I want a little bit more specific. Um, because all of it's in parentheses, so you have to do the little Loving it, loving it. Okay, awesome. You're absolutely right. Notice this time in this problem, she was able to notice, many of you were able to notice that 2 and x are in parentheses. So that is saying all this stuff on the inside of the parentheses is raised to the zero power. What's cupcake to the zero power? So what's 2x raised to the zero power? 1. Now, so this is just equal to 1. Now let's say that you want to get technical and you want to break it down. That's great. I'm going to show you another way to look at this. Um, she was able to see that 2 is raised to the 0 power, so I'm going to show all my work this time. So we have 2 to the 0 power, and we have x to the 0 power here. So if we wanted to show our work, we could. What's 2 to the 0 power? And then x to the 0 power is, so 1 times 1 is, does everybody understand how we got the same answer? Is you're just looking at it different. Okay. How about you go ahead and try this one on your own? Ready, set, go. Write it down on your paper. Just try it. It's okay if you get it wrong. That's why I'm having you try it on your by yourself. You're only hurting yourself if you don't try it by yourself. Getting it wrong is great. That's why we're here. That's why we're doing this, is to learn. So try it by yourself. I'm going to give you about 15 more seconds to try it by yourself. Okay, I want to hear some answers. Shout them out. What'd you get? Four. four. So someone got a four. Is there any other answers out there? It might be right. It might be wrong. Just say it. Yeah, let's write them all down. I'm just putting them off to the side. Okay, anyone else have anything else? Two. You got two. Okay. All right. Awesome. Any others? Did you get anything else, anyone? Okay, let's go through and simplify this one together. So I'm going to ask you a question. Is three raised to the zero power? No. No. So we have three times, well, what's x to the zero power? One. One, and then let's not forget about this floating plus one out here. Now, piece by piece, let's simplify this. What's three times one? Three. Three, three and then we have the floating plus one. What's three plus one? It's four. Okay, good job. Those of you that got the answers two and five, did you see where you might have made a little error and where that was fixed? Awesome, that's why we want to do that. So that's awesome, very good, awesome. Okay, another one. I'm going to let you try it one more time by yourself. Ready, set, go. So I'll read it to you. It's AB raised to the zero power plus five. AB raised to the zero power plus five. You should all be trying it on your own. Okay, any answers out there? Six. Anyone get anything different than a six? Okay, so let's go through it. Is A and B raised to the zero power? Yeah. So both of those will become one. So really we just know that anything raised to the zero power is equal to one. So this whole thing becomes one. So we have one plus five, which is six. Who so needs me to go through and distribute that through and do the math? Anybody? Because I absolutely would love to. But I think most of you are at that point. Okay, let's go through it just once because I think there was a few people out there that raised their hands. Okay, so we have AB all raised to the zero power. So I'm going to rewrite that as A to the zero power and that B is also to the zero power. So we also have B to the zero power. And it was multiplication, so let's put a little multiplication. And we won't forget about this floating plus 5. So then simplifying it piece by piece, A to the zero power is 1. B to the zero power is one, because anything to the zero power is one. So then we still have our plus five. One times one is one. Plus five is equal to six. Any questions? Okay. Everybody good? Okay, moving on. All right. So we'll go through this one quickly so I can let you work on the worksheet for a second. We have two times AB raised to the zero power plus four to the zero. So first of all, is the 2 raised to the 0 power? No. No, so we just have 2 in there. Is A and B raised to the 0 power? Yes. Yes, and I'm going to show my work. So I have A to the 0 power times B to the 0 power. Questions on that part? And I can't forget about my floating plus 4 to the 0 power, but what is that? 
One. So I have really a floating plus one out here. Is everybody comfortable with that? I kind of skipped some steps. Are you okay? Are you feeling okay? Okay. Let's simplify it again. So I have two times, and I'm a mathematician, so I like to keep parentheses and show all my work. What's a to the zero power? And then what's b to the zero power? So then don't forget the floating plus one. Now we have two times, what's one times one inside here? One. So we have two times one plus one. What's two times one? Two. So we have two plus one, which is three. Now a lot of you, um, does that make sense? Okay, now a lot of you are going to be really good at saying anything to the zero power is one, you'll go this quick. That whole thing becomes a one. That whole thing becomes a one. Two times one is two plus one is three. Does that make sense of how to go about it the quick way? Long way never hurt anybody though. It's always a good thing. I mean, whatever you're comfortable with. All right, do problems six through 11 on the worksheet. Pay very close attention to parentheses. I'm gonna be coming around and checking. Um, and work with your neighbor. Now is your time that you can talk. Please talk to each other. Okay, so um, now we're going to talk about a Venn diagram. We're going to shift gears for a second. We're going to talk about a Venn diagram. Now, Venn diagram sounds all scary, but it's, it's not. It's actually a really simple thing, so it's kind of a fancy name for something really simple. Um, so a Venn diagram, guys, now you're going to be seeing this often throughout the year, so you can't forget what a Venn diagram is. Um, a Venn diagram is just a way to group or categorize objects. Um, so it's just an easy way to group objects. So notice on my Venn diagram, I have this circle and I have another circle. And do you see that those circles um, intersect so they overlap? Do you all see that? Do you see how they overlap each other? Okay, now I could add another circle. Venn diagrams don't always only have two circles, but in here, for the most part, we're going to just be dealing with two circles, two categories. So in a Venn diagram, it just has these two circles, and it helps you categorize things. So notice over here in this part of the circle, let me just switch my pen thing. Notice in just this part of the circle right here, notice, um, that's just event A, event A only. Now notice... Over here in this part of the circle, that's event B only. So in here is the intersection of both of those. Does everybody see how this part of the circle is in A and it's also in circle B? Does everybody see that? So it's in event, so that would be event A and B. Are we all okay with that? Does it make sense? Okay. If it didn't make sense, it will when I do my example. So just this next example, I don't want you taking notes. I want you watching because really this will make more sense in an example. Now, I'd be watching definitely um, because if not, you might be lost. All right, so it says place the objects in the correct place in the Venn diagram. Okay, awesome. So let's look at our Venn diagram. You know Venn diagrams have circles and we're going to be dealing with two circles mostly so right here this circle is a red tie and this circle over here is a green tie so what do you think is going to go in here in the middle what do you think it's going to be red and a green tie does everybody see how that intersects red and green are you okay okay let's go ahead and do this then so number one where does it go in my venn diagram red tie can I put it in here? No. no, that would be red and green. This is a red tie. So I want you just watching, not, not writing. Okay, awesome, you're right. So my red tie goes right there. How about number two? Oh. It's red and a green tie. So where do I put it? Middle. Middle. How about number three? Middle. It's also a red and a green tie, so I have to put it in the middle. Number four? Green. Simply green, so it's gotta go over on this side of our Venn diagram. And number five. Green. green. Just a green tie, it's gotta go over here. And yikes, number six. It, it does not belong in here. Very good, so it's not 
a red, it's not a green, it's not red and green, it's a blue tie. Well, okay, so it doesn't fit in our Venn diagram. That's true and that's okay, but we still have the blue tie, so you'll just write it out on the outside of the Venn diagram. Now, if we want to get technical, how a mathematician would say it is, this tie is still in the sample space, so we have to still write it somewhere, but it can be floating outside. Does that make sense? It doesn't fit in our Venn diagram, but we still have a blue tie, so it's got to go on the outside. That would be our sample space. I, yes, it was in our sample space. Does that make sense? Okay, sweet. Awesome. Okay, so at this point, this is where I would take notes again, and then shortly here, I'll let you work on a problem. So Venn diagrams are just an easy way to categorize objects. Okay, now if you're going to be taking notes, you need to be, but just start right here at reflection, rotation, and translation, okay? So um, we're going to be talking now about rigid transformations and symmetry, but first I want to focus on rigid transformations. This is a really fancy word for something really simple. So it, you're going to hear the word rigid transformations for the rest of this year. Don't let it scare you. Say, I know what a rigid transformation is, um, but it's a really fancy word for something not so fancy. So what rigid transformation means is just we're going to take an object and we're going to move it around in some way. Um, so we can either reflect, rotate, or translate an object. That's what a rigid transformation is. A reflection, a rotation, or a translation. So now we'll talk about what each thing means individually. So the first thing we're going to talk about is reflection. So reflection, guys, we've been dealing with reflections since the beginning of time. Um, when we were little girls, we dressed up as princesses, we'd look in the mirror and say, oh, my reflection's so beautiful, I look like whoever, the princess that I'm dressed up as. And let's be honest, boys, you look in the mirror daily and say, that's a good looking fella. We've been dealing with reflections for a long time. Well, they're exactly what you've been dealing with, okay? Reflections are exactly what you've been dealing with. It's just a mirror image. When you look in the mirror, you see your image. So I want you to look right here. This is, this is an example of a reflection. So this is a real world example, guys. There's this beautiful mountain up here and then this lake down here. Now, um, it's reflecting onto the lake um, a mirror image. Do you see how over that red line it's a reflection? A mirror image. Very good. And then here's another, um, here's another example. This guy has a very symmetric face. Some of us actually don't have symmetric faces. But this guy does. Does everybody see how across that red line it's a reflection? If I grabbed it and went like this, it would just be a mirror, mirror image, a reflection. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. So you guys, the important thing that you understand with reflections is we can have reflections um, over this line this way, and we can have reflections over this line. Are you all okay with that? Okay. Now, talking about rotations. Rotations is just moving in circles. So you can take an object and you can move it clockwise and you can move it counterclockwise. So really, rotation just means moving it clockwise and counterclockwise. Are you all okay, all okay with that? Okay, translation. So a translation is just moving an object left and right or up and down. So for example, I'm holding out my piece of paper. This would be considered a translation. Moving my paper left or if I move my paper right, and or if I move my paper up or down. Does everybody understand what translation is? Okay. So we're going to talk about symmetry really quick. Um, what symmetry means is that if you look at an object and you perform a rigid transformation, meaning you reflect it, you rotate it, or you translate it, when you look at it, it looks like it was never touched, meaning you do something to it and it looks the exact same. Does that make sense? So if you, do, if you do some sort of thing to an object and it looks exactly the same, you wouldn't know you even did it, that would be considered symmetric. Does that make sense? A symmetric rigid, rigid transformation. So I'm going to show you an example of that. Looking right down here, now these notes up here are just what we just learned, so I just want you to look. This part, no taking notes on. An isosceles trapezoid, but I'm just going to ask a little aside. What does isosceles mean? Two sides of the same. Awesome, you're right. Say that again. Two sides of the same. 
two sides are the same. So this is why this is an isosceles trapezoid, guys, is because that side and that side are the exact same length. Way to go. Okay, so looking at this isosceles trapezoid, guys, does it have reflection symmetry? It does across where? Up and down. Does everybody see how this has a reflectional symmetry? If I grabbed it by its hind legs and reflected it like this, it would look the exact same, like it was never touched. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to write a reflection. Does it have a rotational symmetry? No, it doesn't. Very good. It doesn't. If we rotated it and moved it clockwise or counterclockwise, it wouldn't look the same. Okay, looking at the right triangle, does it have a, what, I mean, can you see, does it have a reflectional symmetry? No, if I reflected it like this, does it look the same? No. If I reflected it like this, is it the same? No. Okay, how about rotation? So there's never kind of with these, with symmetric, with symmetry. It's translation. We'll talk about translational symmetry in just a second. No. Do you see any rotational symmetry? If I grab this triangle and go like this, bing, does it look exactly the same? Absolutely not. How about down? No. Okay, what about here? Okay, let's try the other way. Okay, okay, so you were able to see there was no symmetry. Now the reason neither of these have translational symmetry, guys, is because you take your eyes, you look right at this object in the exact same spot. Now if I grab it and I translate it, that means move it up and down or left and right. If I move it up here, now if you look in the exact same spot, does it look exactly the same? Yes. You have to look in the same spot with your eyes. So your eyes started here, they have to stay there. If you grab it and move it, are you going to be looking at the same thing? No. 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 So does that make sense about translational symmetry? Yes. So does any object have translational symmetry? No. No, but we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. Okay, um, how about this regular pentagon? Does it have reflectional symmetry? Yes. On what line? What line? Vertical. Okay, vertical line. Does everybody see how if I grabbed it and reflected it, it will look exactly the same? What about rotation? No. Okay, so this is what I would do if I was you. I picture myself grabbing something and rotating it. Does it look exactly the same? Yes. It does. Yeah, it does. Now let's say you weren't for sure. You could trace the shape on your paper so it was exact, and you could actually rotate your paper and say, does that look exactly the same? Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. So this one, I'm not going to write it down. Um, this regular pentagon had reflection and rotation, but not translation. Very good. Okay, so um, this was the what we just talked about. This is actually really cool. So there's no translational symmetry of objects except for a line, and we'll Talk about why. So I told you, if you look at an object, so let's pretend like we're looking at this cupcake down here. That's where we started. If we translate it, so let's say we shifted it, moved it up here, if you look with your eyes to the same spot, do you see a cupcake anymore? Does it, so it doesn't have um, translational symmetry. But let's look at a line really quick. I just want you to make note of this. This line right here has arrows on the end, meaning it's continuing forever and ever that way and it's continuing forever and ever that way. So now, just like the shift on this cupcake, what if I grab the line and shifted it up? Does it look exactly the same? Yes, so the only thing in the whole entire world that has translational symmetry is a line. So no other object does. Does that make sense? Well, if you shift in a different direction. Um, it, then it, it wouldn't technically, but it, it could. Does that make sense how it could have Translational symmetry, but only a line could. So if I said translate it up here, that wouldn't be symmetric, but I'm just asking if in general if it has symmetry somewhere when I translate it. Does that make sense? Okay. Good point. Okay, so just quickly, I don't want you to write these down. Just look. A smiley face has reflectional symmetry, but no rotational. If I rotated that, it would not look the same. An isosceles triangle. Um, it has a reflectional symmetry. If I reflected it, it would look the exact same. It has no rotational. For you advanced thinkers out there, for you advanced thinkers out there, I'm going to ask you a question. Would an equilateral triangle have rotational symmetry? I'm going to ask that again. Would an equilateral triangle
triangle have rotational symmetry? Yes. Yes. Answer it. Yes. Yes. You're absolutely correct. But we're not getting going to get into that. That was just for you, advanced thinkers. You're absolutely correct. It would. Okay, this is my last example, and I'll let you work just right up here. Focus your eyeballs up here to the B. Notice the letter B has reflectional symmetry. Does everybody see how if I reflected it over that line, it would be exactly the same? Okay, my line's a little off, obviously, but... Um, and it has no rotational symmetry. If I rotated it any way, it wouldn't look the exact same. What if I rotated it 360 degrees? I had somebody ask me that last hour. Technically, any object, if you take it and rotate it, 360 degrees, it looks the exact same. Is that correct? Yes. But we're not going to be talking about that. Like, that's not going to count today. Does that make sense? Okay? So, obviously, every object could have rotational symmetry if we allow it to go 360 degrees. But we're not doing that in this class right now. Okay, so you're going to do problems 12 on the worksheet, and you're going to do problem 1-4 in the book. Now, you can do that on the back of your worksheet because I have it laid out so that you can show your work on that. Um, you're going to do problem 12 on the worksheet and 1 dash 4 in the book. That's going to be on page 8 of 1.1.1, but it is just page 8. So we're in lesson 1.1.1 in the book. You will do problem 1 dash 4 in the book, and that's on page 8. Also do this problem. Ready, set, go. Is there anything on the back? Yeah. Those of you, there's a few of you with sleepy eyes, you better slap yourself in the face and wake up and ask your neighbor for help if you need help with these math problems. So wake up, guys. Wake up. This is like the funnest thing ever. I don't know how you're not jumping for joy. One second. Once again, you guys, you need to be taking notes. We're moving on to something new, and this is where it gets a little bit harder. So I need you paying attention very closely. So you guys, it's a conscious decision to be focused and to not let yourself zone out. So do that because I promise, if not, you're going to be lost. So I would not be working on that. You can always go back. Whoa. Um, but you can never learn the material if you're not paying attention to what I'm about to teach you. Okay. Um, so now we're going to talk about, we're going to change, um, we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit. And we're going to remember back to secondary math one, we're going to talk about how to find a slope of a line. So don't write this part down that I'm about to write. I just want to um, remind you, lines are of the form y is equal to mx plus b. What part of that is the slope? M is the slope. Very good. So n is the slope. Well, how do you find the slope? It's rise over run. How many of you learned it to find the slope? by finding the rise and then finding the run, and then it's rise over run. Many of you. So we're going to remember how to do that. So look at this line. I don't want you to draw this. I want you to look. Looking at this line right here, notice I could find the slope. I am struggling with dropping that. We could find the slope by calculating the rise over the run. Now understand, rise is up and down. Run is left and right. Does that make sense? Somewhat. Okay, so then... I am going to go to my example so that we can do it. Okay, so right here is where I probably, I guess, take notes. But really, you guys should know how to do this from secondary one. So if you watch, if you just want to watch, that's fine too for this one. So it says, for the line AB with points at A, negative 1, comma 2, and another point B, 4, comma 3, it asks us to calculate the slope. So the first thing I would do, you guys, is I would draw a picture of those points because then it's really easy. You just look and you actually calculate the rise over the run. So I'm going to plot that point, negative 1, comma 2. So I'm going negative 1 up 1, 2. That's point A. I'm going to draw it in. Now I'm going to draw in point B. That's 4 uh, over 4 up 3. Those are both positive. So I'm starting here at the origin, the middle, and I'm going over 1, 2, 3, and 4 up 1, 2, 3. So we want to know the slope of that line. So this is the line, so I'm going to draw in the line here. But I have to draw really straight, so, even though I didn't. So I hope that doesn't throw you off. Okay, so now we're talking the slope. We have these two specific points. You're going to use those to calculate the exact slope. So we know the slope. The slope is rise over run. So let's first just calculate the rise. So we're going to see how far up we need to go to get to the other point. How far up? 
one. Does everybody see how I just go up one to get to the same line as the point? Rise is one. And then let's count and see how far over we need to go to get for the run to get to that point. So we're going over one. So I'm starting here. One, two, three, four, and five. So that was five units that way. So five. Rise over run. You're just going to count how far up you had to go and then how far over you had to go. Does that make sense? Are you okay? Okay, rise over run. Awesome. So now this is the last thing. Um, I guess, did I go away from that too quick? Are you all, did you get that down? Yeah, that's totally fine. I, I, yeah, sometimes I need to be told, wait just a second. I get a little too excited sometimes. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so now we're going to talk about how to find the distance between two points. This is the only thing I want you to write down. I want you to write this down. This is the formula. So we have D is equal to the square root of, and it reads like this, and I'll explain what it means in a second. It reads like this. In parentheses, we have x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. So it's the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. So parentheses are very important. Get that down and then you'll look up here and um, it'll, it's going to make sense. I'm going to be able to show you. So get that down before I start explaining so you can pay attention. So once you have that down, put your pencil down so I can have you look up here and I can know you're ready. Um, also, just a side note, um, this is like a little mini two down here, and I'm going to explain what that means right now. Okay, are you all ready to just look? Do you all have that formula written down? So, looking at this line here, we have this line, and we have this blue point on the line. We have this green point on the line. We're asked to find the distance between. Now, a lot of people think, I can just count, ding, 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 and that's not necessarily true. You could but you might be off a little because the distance between those two points might actually be 3.11111 and you might count it wrong and you're not going to be able to see that it's 3.1. Does that make sense? So the distance formula allows you to get it exactly right. Does that make sense? Okay, so also we have a blue point, we have a green point, we have two points. Now this is our first point, this is our second point. Well, what does the distance from here to here change? From here to here, no. same distance. So really it doesn't matter which one's considered the first point and which one's considered the second point. It doesn't matter as long as you stay consistent. So I'm randomly choosing the blue point to be my first point. So I'm just going to write a little, oh, that's an eraser mark. Okay. Okay, so I'm randomly going to choose blue to be my first point. So I'm going to put the little sub 1 down there. Just a little mini 1. That just means I'm choosing that to be my first point. I'm choosing this to be my second point. And then from there, you're going to just plug it into the formula. Okay, so it'll make more sense when I do an example. So I'm going to do an example next. Are you all okay? Okay. Okay, so we're going to use those same two points that we used for the to find the slope, which is rise over run. But this time, I'm going to calculate the distance. So this formula, you'll have to have memorized. Um, but for now, you'll be able to use your notes. So once again, we already have plotted those two points. But now instead of finding the slope, it wants to know the distance. So I'm going to use the distance formula. So we had a point A and a point B. Which one do you want to be our first point? B. You want B to be our first point? That's fine with me. So I'm going to say this is an X, Y point. Oh, this is an X, Y point. You guys said you wanted B to be the first point, so I'm going to name it 1. It doesn't matter as long as you stay consistent. So this is our second point. And now all you have to do is plug it into the formula, which is this. So I have D is equal to. The square root, now a lot of people forget to write the square root, so don't. And we're going to put it in parentheses and just plug it in. What is x2? Look at your points. Four. What's x2? Negative one. X2, one. x2 was negative 1, right? So we have negative 1. Minus, I'm just plugging it into the formula. What is x1? Four. 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 So I'm just plugging it in. Is anyone lost on what I just did? I'm not lost. Okay, this is x2, right? Yeah. So I'm going to go over here and find x2. It's negative 1. I'm just plugging it in. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Do you see how we just plugged it in? What x2 is? Okay, good question. Okay, so we have x2, we looked over at our points, we found it, it's negative 1, so we put it in the formula. Minus our x1 was 4, and then it's squared, plus, moving on, in parentheses, what's y2? Look at your points, find y2. 2. It's 2, so then minus y1, look at your points, what's y1? 3. Squared. Now, a lot of people forget to write the parentheses, but it's important you don't. You guys, are you confused about where I got those things? Well, don't you have to have the 2 at the bottom of, like, negative 1 and negative 4 and stuff? This is squared. We're going to keep simplifying this. We're not done. Okay. We're not done. I'm just making sure we're good before I keep moving on. Okay, so let's simplify this further. All right, so what is negative 1 minus 4? Be really careful. What is negative 1 minus 4? You're in debt a dollar. You're in debt a dollar. You borrow 4 more dollars, how much are you in debt? So it's negative 5. You guys, if you're negative 1 and you subtract 4 more, negative 5. So negative 5 squared. So does everybody understand how you have to be really careful? So we have negative 5 squared plus, what's 2 minus 3? Negative 1 squared. Do we have questions? If you have them, please, please ask. Okay, simplifying it again. So what we have here, what is negative 5 squared? Be very careful. Negative 25. 25. Positive 25. Positive 25. Very good. So remember that negative 5 squared is negative 5 times negative 5, which is positive 25. Do you guys all understand? You should know what, how squares work. Definitely. Do you understand that that's negative 5 times negative 5? But that is a common error, so make sure you don't do that. Okay, so we have 25 plus what is negative 1 squared? Positive it's positive 1, because that is one. negative 1 times negative 1, which is positive 1. So we have here the square root, what's 25 plus 1? So we have the square root of 26. Now at this point is where you would type it into your calculator. Once you've combined it all, you'll type into your calculator. You can use your phone for now. You guys need to get a calculator. But you can type in the square root of 26, and you hit enter. It's 5.09901914. But I want you to round to two decimal places, so what's my final answer going to round to be? Um, your decimal's right there. So this was five. Sorry. So this was five point zero nine nine, and it was further. But we're going to round to two decimal places. So it's going to be five point one zero. You guys should be able to round definitely. Okay. Rounding to two decimal places. Any questions on how to find the distance? You use the formula, you just plug it in. Are you all okay? I'm kind of lost because, like, on the D, that's, yeah, and then it has. This just means distance. Like, you're thinking, D just means distance. No, so, I don't have any other problems. Okay. I have problems with, like, the X and then the 2 on the bottom minus X. Okay, so pay close attention. Okay, that's a good question. So pay close attention to what I'm about to say. We did use that. Okay, so remember that those little things are just saying that's my second point. X, that just stands for second point. So remember that we have, so bear with me, remember we have two points. We chose one of them to be the first point. We chose this one to be the first point. So we just put the little mini one in there to say that's our first point. Does that make sense? Okay, so then we have our second point here. We just put in the little mini two down there to just say, you know what, we're going to use this as our second point. And then you use those. So do you see how this goes with this, this is this, this is this, this is this. Now you're just going to plug them into the formula. Uh, so after you get all that, you're not going to use the bottom. Right, because x2 was negative 1. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we're just plugging it in and simplifying it. Okay, I got yeah, it. good questions. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm going to have you guys practice them. Um, I'm going to have you do problem 1-5 in the book.
Practice that. One dash five in the book. You can do it on the worksheets. Um, I do have it. I do have it for you to be able to do it on on the worksheet. Yeah. 